Homework assignment A3 is on convolutional coding and how the Viterbi algorithm works to do the decoding in a convolutional uh, coding uh, forward error correction. We'll be looking at some choices in the complexity of the decoder and how that impacts on performance. So the objectives of this homework assignment is to become familiar with the MATLAB commands when using forward error correction and have be able to interpret the table 7.3 in the textbook from Sklar concerning coding gain for different kinds of codes and to be able to interpret the table 7.4 where we look at the performance of codes. We want to appreciate the advantages and disadvantages of soft and hard decisions and to understand the impact on performance of traceback length and in general to understand performance bounds. So we'll start in the beginning of the assignment to look at the uh, .m file for MATLAB which is provided. And we ask some basic questions which are really just designed to get you to read the MATLAB code which is provided to you and understand the choices that are being made uh, in, the, in the code. Uh, then once you've identified some characteristics of the coding that's going on in this uh, homework assignment, then we're going to look at how you can interpret this uh, digital implementation if we could look at how it would be implemented in hardware. So to take um, a octal representation of the code, the generating uh, um, matrices, if you will, and to interpret them uh, in a hardware implementation. And then uh, we're going to look at uh, how we can use uh, MATLAB to come up with a free distance and the number of paths at the free distance and to look at an upper bound of the coding gain and that's using the equation which is provided in the textbook. So let's start by looking at the commands uh, that MATLAB uses uh, in order to do uh, convolutional encoding and decoding. So this is a summary of the, the commands that we'll be looking at in the homework assignment and I'll be going over them uh, one at a time. So let's start with poly to trellis. And this is starting from a polynomial representation of the encoder and defining in MATLAB a structure which will be the um, uh, decoding uh, trellis. So for instance, in the homework, we might have a constraint length of seven. Um, this might be the first generating uh, matrix, and this would be the second one, and a, a vector, if you will, and this is the vector of connections, and it's written in octal. Um, so you can convert it to binary, and once you convert it to binary, then you'll know the interconnections in the hardware implementation, which is uh, required for one of the problems in the homework. So again, what the, um, uh, co uh, the uh, poly to trellis command is going to do is it's going to look at these uh, interconnections for the um, encoder. It's going to know what are the number of input symbols, the number of output symbols, and with the constraint length it's going to know the number of states. So of course the number of states are going to determine the size of the trellis. So all of this uh, is setting up um, the trellis structure, the memory, uh, that's going to be uh, used in, in MATLAB. So let's look at the optimal codes that are presented in Table 6.4 of our Sklar textbook. So in this case, we're looking at two types of codes. The first are the rate one-half codes, so it's a little hard to see, but this is one-half. And then down here we have the rate one-third codes, one over three. So this is the code rate column, and here are the code vectors. And we know that this is a rate one-half code because we have two vectors for each uh, possible constraint length. So here we sweep through constraint length starting at only three and going down as high as nine. We stop at nine because that's a complexity where uh, the, the, it just gets too high, and so we don't usually go higher than that, uh, especially in MATLAB. But in any case, here we can see that there are three vectors. This is a rate one-three code. So this is the binary code for uh, the interconnections for the shift registers. And when we go into MATLAB, of course, they're using octal instead of using uh, binary. So you'll be able to see the correspondence between the octal code, which is used in MATLAB, and which one of these codes we're actually looking at. Uh, so we're examining one of these optimal codes, and you can find out which one it is. Um, first of all, I should say that the um, Constraint length here 
uh, as I said, starts from three, goes up to nine, and then for each one of these constraint lengths, uh, we're going to find what is the very best code, the free distance of that code, and the best we're going to define, of course, by the free distance. So the way that this table was constructed was by using an exhaustive search. So we would numerically step through all of the possible code vectors for this constraint length, and we would uh, check all of the vectors, and they have an, a, a mathematical way to identify catastrophic codes and to eliminate those. And then all the other ones, they would calculate the free distance. And they would calculate the free distance, and then they might be the two codes have the same free distance, and which one is better. So they would measure uh, how many paths are there at that dis uh, uh, free distance. And of course, the smaller number of paths at the free distance, uh, the better it is. So uh, then they would go on and they would examine, again, there might be two that are the same free distance and the same number of paths at the free distance. They want to know which one was better. So they would go on and say, well, suppose we look at the free distance plus one. How many paths are there there? And et cetera, et cetera. And so by doing all this exhaustive search, they would come up with one which was the best, and that is the one that we find in this table. So in this exhaustive search, there is an equation that is used to um, determine the, the distance, and this algorithm to find the distance is uh, programmed in MATLAB, and so it's available to us, and it's called uh, Distance spec Spectrum. And it calculates the free distance and some other statistics. For instance, if we were to put in this, uh, these parameters into the distance spec so that we were looking at um, constraint length 7 and this particular code vector, and we asked it what is the free distance, first thing we would get back is that the free distance is 10. There's other information that is provided by this command. And for instance, uh, the output uh, that you would receive, uh, which is listed as an event, the first element in this vector would actually be the number of paths that are at this free distance. The next one is the number of paths at the, def the free distance plus 1. So that would be, this is a distance 10. So this would be a distance 11. And there are no paths at distance 11. The structure of this code just doesn't allow it. Uh, so we go on and we say, well, what about at distance 12? And yes, there are 38 paths at distance 12, and we can continue like this. And if you wanted to play, you could start changing these, and you would see um, you know, that they would get worse because this was the actually the optimal code. But dist spec is a MATLAB command that lets you calculate uh, these um, param um, performance metrics which are of interest for the convolutional codes. Uh, so I might say that in the homework assignment, I ask you to use this as, and ask you some questions about it so that we can uh, um, understand, uh, that make sure that you understand how to interpret the results from this uh, MATLAB command. So the next uh, MATLAB command is convolutional encoder, convec, uh, C-O-M-V-E-N-C. And the idea is you have... Uh, where some place where you enter the data and then you output the code words. So, for instance, message uh, underscore original here is the uh, data you want to encode, and trellis is the encoding uh, trellis that you created uh, with the poly to trellis command. Uh, by default, we assume that we always start at the zero state, so all of the registers have zero uh, in them. The last command is the Viterbi detector, the Viterbi decoder. And in this, we will, of course, have an argument, which is the received uh, message, or what we use for the trellis, what was the encoding uh, trellis, which, we, of course, we will use for the decoder. Now we have the traceback length and a couple other parameters. Um, for instance, the traceback length here is a metric, uh, parameter that sets the maximum length of a path that can be saved, that can be observed, that can be used to make a uh, decoding decision. So of course, this is what we're evaluating in the homework assignment, is stepping through different lengths of traceback lengths and finding out how much impact it has on performance. And also, you'll see how slow the decoder is because it might also impact um, how slow it is, and, and mostly because it's using more memory. Uh, the other ones are, for instance, um, 
whether you're using continuous uh, decoding or not. Uh, for us, uh, we're using continuous and therefore the first state is zero uh, by convention and uh, the delay is exactly equal to the, the traceback length. The, the delay means the maximum time that we have to wait for the decoder to make a decision. So there's an instant of time. We'd like to know what was the symbol transmitted at this symbol of time. And we've got to wait the traceback length in case there's not a, a merge previously in order to get uh, an output. So that, that is the delay for this uh, choice of continuous. And of course we have the choice to make uh, hard decisions or soft decisions. And you could examine how the choice of hard or soft, how that impacts performance. And of course we expect soft decisions uh, to give us better performance than hard decisions. But of course it would uh, take a more precision and therefore more complex hardware in the decoding. Now, we're going to uh, do Monte Carlo simulations so that we're going to uh, determine what is the uh, bit error rate. So this is our goal. We want to get an estimate of the bit error rate versus the bit error rate on this side versus the EB over N0 because, of course, there will be the um, uh, uh, uncoded, uh, I guess I was a little too pessimistic here, there will be the uncoded. And then if you add coding, you know, you should see something improve. So something better than the uh, standard additive white Gaussian noise curve. So that would be the uncoded one. That would be our theoretical one. And by adding complexity, we should be able to get something better. That would be the coded one. So we're going to be estimating the bit error rate uh, for the coded one. For the uncoded one, of course, we, we have the theoretical curve. But we have an approximation um, for this curve, which I'll talk about a little bit. But uh, we'd like to see how good that approximation is. We'd like to estimate the bit error rate the only way we know how, which is by doing Monte Carlo simulations. So in this case, we're going to be examining fairly low EB over N0, fairly low because it's a very high performance code. So it's going to give us a lot of, uh, we're going to be much better than the uncoded version. So we're only going to go in the range of like 0 to 7 dB uh, and by steps of half of dB. And we'll be uh, running this Monte Carlo simulation. And remember, there's two things that we can set up. One is to only count 100 errors. If we count 100 errors, we're going to get a good estimate of the bit error rate. Remember, the bit error rate is the number of errors divide, divided by the total number of symbols which were examined. So if I count 100, I'm going to get a good estimate. If I only count one or two, I'm going to get a terrible estimate of the bit error rate. So, uh, but if I count a million of them, I'm not going to get a better estimate or not significantly better estimate than if I only counted 100. So we're going to stop our um, loop if we get up to 100 errors, because that's enough errors to get an accurate bit error rate estimate. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to limit the total number of bits I can look for. So if our uh, bit error rate estimate, our bit error rate estimate is the number of errors divided by the number of bits uh, examined. In one case we're saying 100 is enough, and the other one is, well, the more I examine, the more chance I'll get an error, and you think the more accurate I'll get, but, you know, there's a patience that I lack. <laughs> and after a certain amount of time, you know, i got to go on and do another homework assignment, so I can't spend all my time on this one. So I limit, essentially, the uh, execution time. And the way I limit execution time is by limiting the total number of bits that it's examined. And so you can play with that number depending on the computer that you're running it on and how... Uh, fast the computer is. So it's really just about uh, elapsed time. So I said that there was an estimate for the bit error rate versus EB over N0 and that is given in the BER coding uh, command in MATLAB. It's for QPSK or BPSK uh, only and it's for an additive white Gaussian noise channel. Uh, we're only examining an additive white Gaussian noise channel, channel but of course um, these convolutional codes and other forward error correction codes are going to be used on all kinds of channels. But uh, this um, estimate, and it comes from the union bound, so sometimes it's called a bound, but it's really, really an approximation. Uh, it's for a given coding rate, but not for a specific code. So we'll specify um, a constraint length, 
a code rate and it will say it has a minimum distance but we haven't actually told it what the code is. So it's just taking these parameters and making an estimate of the uh, performance of the code. Um, it's an estimate that could be useful. We'll see if it's useful for predicting performance, but it could be a nice tool when you're doing an exhaustive search to have some idea about where you want to find it, uh, how close you're getting, and whether it's useful. So in any case, this is a command that you can uh, plot, and then uh, plot on top of it the points from your uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So here's um, an example of how we can use BERT tools. Uh, because BERT tools is a way to have sort of a shorthand to get access to this BERT coding uh, command. So, for instance, uh, in this um, graphic, what I've done in the purple line is to plot the uh, theoretical equation for additive white Gaussian noise, QPSK. So this is the standard curve that we've seen many, many times. Now, in BERT tools, I can also specify um, a... Uh, code that's being used and it will give me an estimate of the performance of those codes. And these are two different codes. Uh, there are two different um, uh, constraint length 4, um, one half rate code, constraint length 7, uh, I think it's a, yeah, a, a one third rate code, just to give you an example of what you can plot in BERT tools. And of course, what's interesting to see is that they have two different um, uh, thresholds, which is not surprising. They're different performance codes. So there's a couple things that we can see from this kind of plot. First of all, I can say, what is the gain of this yellow? This is uh, k equal 4, uh, constraint length 4, and the code is 1713. Uh, so this yellow one, if I look asymptotically, I can look here and say, what is the coding gain? So this tells me, let's see if this works out. This could tell me the um, coding gain. So the coding gain is again the, um, the reduction in the required EB over N0. So that's one way to measure the performance of a code. And of course, um, this is a higher performing code. And if I look here, of course, this code, which is a one-third rate code and a longer constraint length code, is having better performance, and the gain is much larger. In addition to looking at the gain, uh, this plot allows me to look at the threshold, the FEC uh, threshold. And the FEC threshold, remember, is the um, threshold where the performance of coding helps me or doesn't help me. For instance, here, here is the intersection of these two curves of the um, uh, non, no coding curve and the coding curve. And so I know that if my um, EB over N0 is below 5, it, this code is not going to help me. But if I'm above 5, well then I can get uh, improvement and asymptotically when I'm up into more interesting regions like 10 to 15, I mean that region um, I'm going to get something like 2 dB gain, uh, coding gain, when I use this code. Now, if I compare it with the higher performing code, constraint length 7, rate 1 third, uh, this would be the intersection. And you can see that now, even a code as bad as uh, EB over N0 of equal to 4 dB, I would still get improvement uh, using this board error correction. And asymptotically, I could get up to uh, 4 dB of gain uh, when I have even higher EB over N0. So these are the kinds of discussion I would like to see in the homework assignment for you to interpret uh, a graph such as this and in your case uh, you'll also be having you know little points which are your uh, Monte Carlo simulations. You're going to be uh, every half dB from 0 to 7 you're going to be uh, plotting uh, what is your estimate of the bit error rate and really you should be using a fit of, of that curve to look at, you know, what is the uh, coding gain, etc. So these are the uh, concepts you should be looking at in this uh, simulation in MATLAB. So here are some typical results from a homework assignment. You would have a curve which is no coding. 
you would maybe have a code for soft decision, uh, excuse me, some results for soft decision, some results for hard decisions. There's many different ways that we can look at it, and it varies a little bit in the homework assignment from year to year, but these are the kinds of things you'll be asked to look at. And so we could, uh, for instance, see in the solid line would be the approximation coming from the Burr coding uh, command, and in these asterisks and pluses, these would be the Monte Carlo estimates that you're coming up with. And you can see they're, you know, where they're accurate, where they're less accurate. Um, here would be the approximation, and here would be your uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And if you're counting a lot of errors, your Monte Carlo simulation should be pretty accurate. If you're, uh, you know, examining a whole lot of bits, get, counting a lot of errors, it should be very accurate. So, so here, this is probably a place where the um, uh, union bound is not necessarily very accurate. So, you would be able to see where the intersection is. For instance, there's a difference between the intersection from the approximation and maybe from the Monte Carlo, and uh, also the coding gain. Uh, coding gain is probably pretty accurate at getting coding gain. For instance, here I put a line at 10 to the minus 3 because we have to specify, I say asymptotically, but I have to specify my saying at 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4. Here I put 10 to the minus 3 just so, you know, I could see it on the plot that I made. Um, but, you know, you specify uh, the uh, coding gain at 10 to the minus 3, or in a table, as you'll see in SCLAR, it will say the coding gain at 10 to the minus 6 would be a popular reference. So again, one of the uh, things we'll be examining are different traceback lengths, and uh, you'll be generating a plot for each one of traceback lengths. And we would see that longer and longer traceback lengths, we would expect to get better and better performance, but maybe it saturates at some point, and that's the kind of thing uh, that you can examine. So we ask you to do these plots at different traceback lengths, and then we ask you to look at it and analyze it, and say, you know, discuss what kind of impact does it have? Uh, what kind of choice would you make for a reasonable uh, traceback length? You can think about um, your simulation time, did it take a really long time to simulate and is there, uh, would, you, would that uh, make an impact on your system choice that, you know, it saturates and it gets not much better performance, it takes really long time so I would choose another value. That's the kind of discussion we want to see uh, in this kind of question. You could, for instance, compare soft and hard and again this varies from year to year, I might ask different kinds of questions, but uh, you know, we could compare, for instance, the coding gain at different traceback lengths with different kinds of coding. So just once again, it's important to specify at what level of bit error rate, and I know they're very small, but these are different decades of bit error rate. Uh, here, of course, is the uncoded curve. Here is the uh, a, a fit of the Monte Carlo results at certain points for the beta error rate estimates for the coded system uh, with a Ford error correction code. And if I look at uh, this level, which I believe is 10 to the minus 3, um, and I were to look at what is the coding gain at this level, well, you know, I would look at, you know, what is the EB over N0 required here and here, and I would get, you know, a certain coding gain at that level. And if I were to look at it uh, at a lower rate, um, maybe now I'm at 10 to the minus 5, uh, I would get another value. And you can see, of course, it's bigger. And, of course, if I, um, here would be the, um, sorry, here, the, the gain I would uh, calculate. And if I did it at the third point, of course, I get something else. But, but eventually, of course, it will saturate the difference between them. But um, uh, we, we like to, s to specify them at values which are, uh, typical target points for our system. So that is why we might specify at 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 9 or whatever the standard is uh, that we want to examine. So just uh, remember to specify uh, the coding gain at which uh, bit error rate level. Okay, so just uh, again, um, this is for either soft or hard, but uh, we could have uh, asked a question uh, here, I, I can't remember if this was soft or hard, but it's one of the two. <laughs> uh, so to, comparing soft and hard, we talked about coding gain, but of course we could also talk about feck threshold. 
Here there are two different codes, two different FEC thresholds, but if you had different trace band lengths or comparing soft and hard codes, you would have a collection of curves and they would have different uh, FEC thresholds as well.